This episode of Observations is sponsored by The John Campia Show. Find The John Campia Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi, your evangelist of the imagination, and the as-yet-undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm Rob casting at you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post-geek singularity community, and this is Rob Observations episode number 857. This is a very special episode of Rob Observations. After all, uh, in the YouTube pundit space, we talk about movies and television and all the things that we love to watch all of our lives. All of those things began with words on paper. The writers are at the core of every great story ever told, especially our great legacy of television and movies. And we are in a golden age of streaming shows, everything from Succession to House of the Dragon to Yellow Jackets to even movies like Honor Society. Uh, There are so many great things to see nowadays, and they were all brought to us by writers. Interestingly enough, Gary Beekler, nerdrotic as you know him, has been doing some really interesting videos. He's been dropping them every week. He's got some two great editors working on them. And he asked me about the writer's strike, and I said, you know... What if I could get somebody, a big mocker, somebody that could tell us what was going on, and what if we could both interview him? So please welcome to the show, he's never been on the show before, Gary Beekler, Nerdrotic himself. Gary, it is a great honor to have you. It was great seeing you in Vegas, and um, wow, I mean, I I feel uh, unworthy, but thanks for being here. Oh, stop. I feel unworthy being here. Uh, yeah, it was a quick conversation. I reached out to you, and I'm like, you know, I'm I'm doing some work on this writer strike thing, and uh, I need to know more about it. I, I I know what I read in in the in the trades, and I've heard one side, largely one side, and I want to hear the other. I, I'd like you know, because I I actually like to get to the truth of the matter, and uh, try to be as form informed as possible. I certainly have my opinions about things. But uh, thanks for having me on. This is, this is, uh, this is going to be tons of fun. Well, so I went to somebody, one of the nicest people I've met in the entertainment business. He's a man that began his career writing for the Golden Girls, believe it or not. Uh, more recently, for you imagination connoisseurs, he worked on Star Trek Enterprise. He was most recently uh, a executive producer of the Orville. And he is also now writing films for... Everybody from Paramount Plus to, I don't know who, but uh, we're going to talk to him. He was the former president of the Writers Guild of America West, and he is the current co-chairman of the negotiating committee on the Writers Guild side. Please welcome to this show, I'm very honored to have him once again, Mr. David A. Goodman. David, welcome to Observations. Thanks, Rob. You know, I listened to that opening. And you said, you know, it's episode number 857, right? You said, is that what you said? Yes, I did. And then you said, it's a very special episode. How many of those 857 episodes did you start out by saying this is a very special episode? I, honestly, honestly, not that many. Not of the I, daily I, shows. Less than 100? or well, I would say less than 25. <laughs> I swear. Well, then I'm very honored. Thank you. Very honored. For you. Well, I think, you know, David... There's a lot of people that don't understand what any of this is all about. I mean, they've heard things like residuals. They've heard the term writer's room. Um, And so I guess what I wanted to ask you is, in simple terms, what is the Writers Guild of America and what are they so upset about? Um, Well, that's a very good question. I mean, we're a union. Uh, many years ago in Hollywood, writers organized themselves into a what's called a collective bargaining unit, and they they said we all share issues uh, about compensation, about credit, um, 
like many, uh, and, and had similarities and differences to other unions. And over the years, uh, that, that group of writers in this union have been able to collectively bargain for health benefits, for a pension, like many unions in America. And uh, that this is a, it's a very strong union, and it's a very strong union because the members of it do something that not everybody can do. Writing is a, it's a combination of skill and talent, and, uh, and writing for film and television uh, are unique uh, skills and talents, re require unique skills and talents. And so we, we're a union um, every three years, we uh, negotiate a contract with, with the companies that employ us. And in that contract, we set out what writers are paid. And uh, we, it's called a minimum basic agreement. And what that means is the, 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 the contract says, if you're going to hire a writer to write for a television show or write a movie or work on a late night talk show or a game show, uh, you have to pay them specific minimum amounts of money. You can pay them more than that minimum, but at the very least, if you want to hire a writer, this contract uh, lays out uh, the minimum amount that that writer can be paid. Um, what we're so uh, upset about is that in this negotiation with the companies, we raise a lot of issues. Um, writers are having, it, it may be hard for people out in the uh, rest of the world to understand, but writers are having trouble making a living. And that's obviously a very common thing in America. Uh, the comp and it's a common thing too that the large companies we work for are making huge, huge profits. The, 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 the people who run these companies have, uh, are paid millions of dollars. Uh, collectively, they're paid over a billion dollars. And uh, yet they don't, they the writers who write the, the one product they make film and television shows uh many of them uh can't afford to pay their rent i mean i'm not actually exaggerating that need to have two jobs not and the second job is not a job as a writer um to stay a writer and so we decided in this negotiation we were going to seriously try to address some of these issues and the companies refused refused to so they so uh one of the that one of the unfortunate um, requirements of being in a union is that sometimes you have to exercise your power, and a union's power is its ability to go on strike and deprive uh, the employer of the thing you make. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? No, absolutely. And I I think that you know obviously we've heard a lot about the changing landscape of streaming as opposed to network television, which is. Right dying on the vine, old paradigms are being replaced by new paradigms. And a lot of the time with, say, broadcast television, if you wrote for a successful show, whether it was ER or Cheers or Friends, right. something that every time it aired, they were paid for by advertisers. So the shows made a lot of money. And every time it aired, a certain amount of money would come in that was very identifiable. And the writers would get residuals based on the performance of the show's that they had written. Same thing with movies. If you wrote a big hit successful film that spawned franchises um, based on what you had negotiated, the writers did well um, based on that kind of success. But now you can make a $200 million movie for a streamer uh, like a Red Notice or a $220 million movie like a Gray Man. It goes on to the streamer and there's no revenue stream. There's no residuals. There's no, I mean, maybe well, somebody... Are, there are residuals that just don't... They're not they're not as good as they as they were. But there's also just larger issues that are sort of more widespread than just the residual issue, because even the what the writers used to get paid up front, not you're, you're talking about residual back end. Yeah, the back, which was a way that the Writers Guild was able to say if a writer wrote, writes something that ends up earning a lot of money for its uh, for its for its producer, the, the studio that that writer deserved a portion of that and that money was paid up front. Uh, but now, uh, not, that, isn't just, that isn't just the only problem that the streaming residuals aren't as good as, as they were in the old model as you laid out. It's also just what a writer is paid 
to write the thing to begin with mm. that has been uh, uh, you know suppressed by this new streaming model um, for a number of reasons uh, most of which is that you have in in the old broadcast model you um, writers would be working on a show while it was being produced now writers the, the the writing is separate from the production and they'll have a group of writers in a room and for 10 weeks and they've got to write the whole season and then they're then they're paid the minimum that they could be paid there many many times those writers are fired they don't even know if the show's going to go and one writer the probably the person who created it and maybe one other then have to supervise the production of that show. And so all those other writers who helped break that show, figure out all the stories, write those scripts, uh, aren't making nearly enough to survive. And all this work that used to be spread out among a group of writers is now being done by one writer. And so in, both, in all those cases, nobody, nobody's uh, getting what they deserve. the quality we've seen on streaming that that for sure uh i have a question if you can't answer any of these questions of course like no, don't uh, but I, I i have a question about streaming numbers because i know that's something that you guys were asking for is like just transparency mm -hmm. transparency in that and uh it's as a just i'm a dummy so paying customer that's all i am i'm the end user right can you answer why they don't share these numbers? I mean, I know we all know, but uh, like, is that something? Do you think that they'll eventually have to? I mean, I think they would eventually have to do it, especially with. I heard um, it was just anecdotal, but I heard uh, um, a, a conversation about you know music streaming and how they don't share the number. They'll they'll tell them some nebulous number, right. but they don't give the artists any specific numbers. Right. And it's like, trust me, bro, on being paid. Is <laughs> is that? Do do, you, do showrunners get access to numbers? Do do people who are getting paid get access to these numbers? No, I mean, you know, you 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 that, that that they don't. That's one thing the guild is always fighting for, and the guild actually gets some access to the information, but they keep. They, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's kept confidential, but the guild can use it in negotiating its contract. But the bigger, the bigger thing you're talking about, which is absolutely right, which is they don't, they don't share with the creators of the show uh, or, or the writers or even directors or in many cases, the actors, you know, uh, don't know if the show is a success. The, the streamer will tout its successes in to Wall Street and to the public, but they, they'll keep those numbers uh, secret, mostly to keep people from having leverage to ask for more money for the next thing they do or on that thing. But the way it's going to change is and it's already going to change because these uh, these streamers are heading to um, an ad supported model. Mm -hmm. they're, they're starting to sell ads and that they want. And in order to set advertising rates, that is to, speaking to the public, if you if you at you know if Colgate toothpaste is advertising on an episode of uh, Friends, uh, the, the, the 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 producer or the station can say, well, Friends gets a huge rating, so if you want to buy a commercial on this, it's going to cost you X amount of money. Um, the advertisers will not pay a lot for an ad unless they know that the show is well um, well watched. Uh, and so it's going to be, the streamers are not going to be able to keep that information a secret if they want to uh, go to an ad-supported model. So that information is going to start to come out in other ways and and the guild also continues to fight for it uh in in other ways too but but you raise you know an excellent point and that that's but i think we're we're going to see a future in the in a in the near future we're going to start getting a lot more of that information uh, you know i would ask about budgets obviously when i as a as an indie producer Obviously, when you're negotiating with a writer and your 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 indie film is is a WGA signatory as it should be, um, there are there are fees built into tied to say the budget. You know, uh, a writer would get a percentage based on the budget of the film. 
uh, or something, th things like that. Um, now we see like Amazon will make six episodes of a show like Citadel with a reported budget of 40 minutes each with a reported budget of $300 million. And, and they're a streaming show, and yet do the writers get compensation based on the amount of money that they're spending on a, on a, on a six-episode series? I mean, no, and that's that's something. I mean, that's something we, we can't even like address. Like that that, and it's not something we would try to. All we would say is, um, because because there are also shows uh, where you know it's two million dollars an episode. Sure. Um, so what we want to say is, you want a writer to write a script, uh, it costs this much money. You can spend a hundred million dollars to make the episode, or you can spend one million. You want the script, it costs this much money. Uh, a, an hour script, a half hour script, a late night script, whatever those, whatever those scripts are, it's more important for, for us to set the price and say that uh, this script costs this much money. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with a big name writer or producer, uh, a writer, producer, or writer, director, the studio may say, well, you know, this writer uh, is worth a lot. His name or her name or their name is worth a lot to us as a promotable model, promotable person creating something for us. So we'll pay that mo person a lot more money. But the guild is just more concerned with the working class writer. What is the minimum that writer can be paid? So so we're not, the, the but the budget thing you bring up is is again sort of like, an interesting issue in in this streaming world, not in terms of our contract, but more in terms of um, these streamers, you know, competing with each other for viewers. And, and first, by starting throwing all this money into shows to try to get an audience, and then once they have the audience pulling back on those budgets, you know, and that, that, you know, I think we've seen that in some of these places like, like Netflix is, is I don't think spending nearly what they used to on their television shows because they have their audience. They got people to show up. Uh, whereas Amazon is still trying to break into that viewer marketplace. I think that I don't think they get the same, nearly the same number of viewers that some of the other streamers get. Actually, Paramount Plus, I think it right now is doing quite well breaking into the marketplace and getting getting subscribers and viewers. But, you know, they're spending that money trying to get people to watch their new streaming service. Well, you know, I would say what's interesting to me is I just watched Netflix. Uh, they have a show called The Diplomat, yeah. um, mostly female writing staff. Uh, the show creator was a West Wing veteran, mm -hmm. Rufus Sewell and um, Carrie Russell in it. Yeah, Great show. Good. I thought the show was terrific. Uh, I really liked it. It was essentially set almost in one state house, one right. house, one yeah. large house. And it was just as entertaining as yep. all the action in the world thrown at right. the screen. Yep. And and I would say what makes that show great is in fact the writing, and and at the end of the day, you can have as many th bombs go off and you can have as much action and you can have as much mayhem, right. but it still has to be compelling. And Absolutely. when you're writing, it doesn't matter whether you're writing The Diplomat or you're writing Extraction Two, you know, which is another movie they have coming out. It's still right. the quality still has to be there. So with streaming though, I just I don't understand. <laughs> why they're spending so much money on a lot of these movies that have no literally no monetary return on Netflix except subscri subscribers they're going to move to an ad based model as you pointed out but uh a 200 if if something's 2 hours long uh does it make it more does it make it 200 million dollars is that this is that 100 million dollars more exciting than a 100 million dollar movie which is then Fifty million dollars more exciting than a fifty million dollar movie. Right. It doesn't seem like there's any delineation or any rhyme or reason to how much money the streamers are spending on these things. So why are why are the writers, the very people that originate these things, why are they not being treated fairly? Well, I mean, I mean that that that's a story as old as Hollywood. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've seen, you know. Uh, uh, What's the, what's the, you know, what was the Charlton Heston movie? Was it The Greatest Show on Earth? That sort of big budget flop that came out in the... <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, they'll spend money on, on, on something in, in, a, in, a, in, a, 
in the theory that you create a blockbuster, you create something that's that's uh, you know, like unavoidable because it, it looks so big and great that people are going to show up, and that's what the streamers are doing. They're they're trying to get get the audience. They're trying to get you know, Lord of the Rings on Amazon is a great example. Like, great great uh, great intellectual property, built in audience, and the movies were huge. And so let's let's spend a lot of money and make, and I'm and I'm sorry I didn't watch it, so I'm not gonna I I don't know whether it was good or not, but but that's not even the point. You it, missed got, it got people, you know, it got people to show up. People subscribe to to Prime to see it, and so that's why you spend that money to try to get out in the world with something that that people or you know with the diplomat. I mean, you know, Carrie Russell. I mean, she she's a I think. She, there's that's an actress who has an audience you see her it's like oh gary russell oh let me check this out and she was ferocious in the role but uh, you know i would ask you this so for instance okay rings of power you know uh netflix has a rule that if a viewer starts a show and doesn't finish the show if it, that's a called their completion rate, if a show right. has a completion rate right. of less than fifty percent, they cancel it. Right. Right. Well, a show that like Rings of Power obviously had a thirty percent, thirty-seven percent completion rate in the U.S. and a forty-five percent completion rate in Europe. Right. And yet, they're still moving forward with a with a season two because they have so much money invested. I, I would think that 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 would be a telltale sign that perhaps the writing might not be where it's supposed to be. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into that. I, yeah, of course. Me, me, these are businesses. I mean, I have friends who wrote for the show who, who I know are great writers. So I, 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 I didn't watch it, so I don't have a personal opinion. But about what it, I, but, what I but, mean is, though. But, but that it may not be that it's the writing. I mean, you know, it's not. It may not be. There's all sorts of reasons that an audience doesn't connect to, this, to a show. Um, and, and it may, you know. Could, you know that that's that's not the uh, that's not the issue. To me, the bigger issue, honestly, is that uh, that there's a there without talking about the quality of the writing, without talking about you know uh, somebody's uh, uh, um, uh, unobjective opinion about it. Like I like this, you don't like this, whatever it is. To me, the more important issue is making sure that. Uh, writer there there's plenty of writers who are able to continue a career so that uh they can stay writers so like so we're we're in a genre space here i'll talk about a genre writer who i'm who i'm a big fan of who i think is a great example uh is ron moore uh right. so you have ron moore he, he sells his spec or gets his first episode of the bonding on next generation i third season I, I only, third season I I uh, I know Ron vaguely. He, he might be surprised how much I know about his career. I uh, you know he's, he he starts out on that staff. He's a brand new writer. He's right, working for a great writer, Michael Piller, who has just reinvented Star Trek: The Next Generation and made it the show that it would become and the show we would we would revere. Um, he works on that show till the end. He then goes and works at uh, Deep Space Nine for. I receive and bear. Now Ron's a lot more experienced than he was when he started. He's had uh, four years, five years, whatever it is on next gen. Now he goes over to deep space nine and he's at on that show during its, its heydays working. He's a more experienced writer, but he's also working for a very experienced writer, Ira, Ira bear. And then that staff is filled with great writers, uh, Bob Wolf and, and, uh, um, uh, Renee Echeverria and uh, you know and that show goes its run and then eventually uh, Ron leaves and gets his chance to do his own show and he does Galactica which is just incredible an incredible genre show and but I don't think Battlestar Galactica doesn't exist I don't think without Ron getting that apprenticeship with those writers and then getting that work experience even when it was no longer an apprenticeship, even by the time he's on Deep Space Nine, he's a he's a you know great writer in his own right. But he's still like learning. He's still expanding his uh, his skills. And so that when he gets his chance to do his show, he is uh, he does something that is amazing and and so memorable. And that's what we're losing uh, in this current model. We're losing that that ability to apprenticeship because 
there are these short orders. Writers don't to work for that long. Um, they uh, that they, they they're struggling to survive as writers. A lot of them have to drop out of the business sooner than they would have, uh, and they're also not getting that the the apprenticeship of like learning how to make a show because they're only in the writer's room. They're only doing the writing. They're not part of the production. They're not getting to see uh, how to interact with actors, how to be involved in the editing process, how to how to mix a show, how to all those things that writers learn uh, at the at the knee of more experienced writers. That that apprenticeship is disappearing and that will affect the business in a really uh, negative way that 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 if we don't keep writing as a career and allow those apprenticeships to happen, um, that that are just part of the daily work, they're not apprentices. These are writers being hired to write, but they're getting to learn and work by working with other writers about how do you make stuff. Uh, the companies have benefited enormously from these decades long thing that we've had, and now it's going away. And they and and it will affect the product. It will make it. For less good stuff, uh, and that that is also part of this fight that we're in. Well, that was one of the things I was kind of going to go in that direction. One, of, the other thing, I mean, I know people that began as writers' assistants. Right. You know, they were in the room, and and they were. And the thing about writing TV is, you have to understand the production aspects of television in order to be able to write for your budget, to be yeah. able to write for yeah. your sets, to right. be able to write uh, uh, right. to know. Uh, what you can get away with on an eight-day schedule for, say, an episodic or something like that. Right. And and the whole industry, I mean, we're already losing um, institutional knowledge of people that have been at the studios for a long time because they're older, their salaries are more expensive, and they're seen as being expendable. Right. I, I see this across, especially in post-production, in order to cut costs, and I wonder who's going to be left, you know, like you said, in 10 years to even right. make any of these things. Now, well, yeah. Well, they may go to ChatGPT. So, yeah. but, but, but the thing about ChatGPT is it, it's, it can only do what it can scrape off the right. internet. So all right. it can do is borrow what other people have already yeah. done without the right. insight into what makes yeah. things work and not. Yeah. Yeah. Is that's another that's another issue. Do you do you think that AI or AI assisted writing should be allowed at all, or or well, how what does we're the... asking for is like you know our worry is not like our worry we're not like what it's part of our our um negotiation which companies will not talk to us about but we're saying um what we're worried about is is a uh, is studios using ai to generate a story or a crappy script and it's not and as you say it's not original it's the, the way the way ai works now is it's scraping other people's work off the, it's stealing from other people's work yes. and throwing into its uh, uh, its theft and putting it in and, and spitting something out and that that's what we're worried about is that a studio exec decides oh let's let's uh, give me an uh, give me a story for a romantic comedy or give me a story for a thriller uh, with the male and female lead and it ChatGPT spits something out and now the studio is like giving it to a human writer and saying, okay, uh, we want you to develop a script from this story, but right there you have, you have watered down the process and the writer is no longer getting full credit for the work uh, he, she, or they are gonna have to do right. to make this an actual movie and they're gonna be paid less because rewriting is paid less than actual full on writing. So the only thing we're asking for is that the first writer on, on every project has to be a human being. Um, the idea that we have to ask for this is like the worst episode of Black Mirror. I, uh, huh. It's just not like, why do we have to do this? But we have to. And we tried that and we didn't think it was that big an ask. And the company said no. So what is that? They said we will not. We're not going to limit our abilities to take advantage of this technology. So where are we headed? We're headed to really crappy stuff written by uh, an AI stealing from other people's work. And we've got to got to stop that but we can't stop the flow of technology we can't you know we can't put an end to ai and we're not trying to we're, we're all we're saying is you want what's special about us as writers the first the first writer on a project's got to be human that's not a big ask no 
especially because the things that are being scraped are already copywritten and owned by yeah. the studios anyway. Right. They're not very good. So, I mean, like, <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, that's. But I could, I could thing. see a scenario, uh, and I don't think it's, we're that far away from, like, let's say you had a long running a long running police procedural like that's been on for 10 years you know like a csi or a ncis ncis or or one order chicago or, pd uh or, or whatever these been on forever and let's say you took all of those scripts the studio owns those scripts put all those scripts into a specific ai i think ai probably could generate something not maybe not arable but something like a story that then a writer would rewrite and that's really weak yeah that's really uh, because I think that that will reduce the number of jobs for writers, and that and that's no good. You've got a first writer hired; it's got to be a got to be a person. So, so it sounds like you're trying to like get ahead of this before it becomes a real problem. Uh, the question I want to take you back to to three years. You said so. You negotiate every three years. So three years ago. Uh, I mean, a lot has changed in the last three years. We had COVID. They put the gas down on streaming. Like, how different was it for you back then when you were negotiating? Did you see? Did you guys see any of this, this coming? Well, we knew we knew that there were streaming issues we wanted to address, but, and and so we were we and and there was the possibility in 2020 that we there was a lot of talk back then that we might consider going on strike. Uh, and then what happened was COVID hit. And uh, the fact is you can't go on strike during a pandemic because right. you can't pick it. You, right. can't, you know, you can't do all the things you need to do. And so the companies knew that, but they also still wanted to make a contract with us. And we actually still ended up getting a few good things in that contract, including a, a paid family leave, which no other union in the country has, which is amazing. Uh, but but we we certainly didn't see AI. I didn't, we didn't, we weren't, we weren't even talking about AI six months ago. Right. Nobody was talking about that as a threat. And then we started talking about it right as we're getting into negotiations. And then we had our proposal in negotiations and it was starting to get like traction and, and starting to grow up. And then we got scared uh, in negotiation because we make this proposal that we thought was like, oh, they'll give this to us. This is not a big deal. And then they didn't, and they wouldn't even talk about it. And suddenly we're like, "Oh, good! I'm glad we I'm glad we thought we got to get ahead of this, because we really got to get ahead of this. They're they're thinking about it, and um, so I think that that uh, you know that that's a really. Uh, but three years ago, um, three years ago, writers were having some of the issues we're talking about, and but they were growing. They weren't. I don't think they were. I think there are a lot of writers who are having these problems, but they've gotten m even much worse in the last three years. <coughs> well, I, I, you know, another. Hey, Rob, you're right. Yeah, I was just, I just drank water the wrong way. Um, <laughs> actually, we have, we have a um, uh, Tom Jr. Jackson sends in a super chat and says, uh, SAG authorized a strike vote for their members. So Tom asks, that was, that happened today. If SAG decides to strike and then the DGA strikes as well, the DGA has never struck, though. What would be the impact? And would everything come to a halt? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, can't really speak, I can't really speak to what those other unions are going to do. Obviously, really support uh, SAG and its efforts to get a good, and DGA, but SAG taking a strike authorization vote, I think, is a, it, it tells us that that union that want, wants to get serious about, like, uh, improving the lives of their members, and I, I applaud that. Um, I think that I, I can't. I wouldn't talk in that that hypothetical. I think that um, you know, obviously, a, a strike like that obviously would would shut everything down. I, I don't. I wouldn't speak to whether either. I would never want those unions to comment on what we're going to do, and I don't know what they're going to do. But I, I, I appreciate all the support we've gotten from SAG and DGA in our strike there are a lot of a lot of members showing up on picket lines and picketing with us and joining us at, at a rally and 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 giving us support in the media and uh so that 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 has helped strengthen our strike our strike turn if you perfect world what would be if if the wga could get everything that it was asking for reasonably so 
what would the be the best case scenario for the guild at the end of this strike? What would you guys like to see happen if well, you, you know, if we, you got everything? Well, then I, I could go home. That would be the best case scenario. <laughs> I wouldn't have to be on picket line. I that's the best. I would go back to being a writer. I uh, I think that's the best case scenario. Well, I think that the. But seriously, I'm not going to talk about specifically, but but we have we have so many issues like people who write movies, for instance. Again, we have this kind of I think America probably has this image of like, oh, movie writers, how you have it so great. There are some very, very successful uh, movie writers who do quite well and live very, very good lives. But overwhelmingly, the, most of the people who work in that side of the business are sort of forced to do all this free work or it yeah. takes forever to get them paid. Their, their, their movies never get made. They're, they're constantly pitching ideas and writing specs and doing their best to stay a movie writer and not making even enough money to live. If there are comedy variety writers, people who write for um, uh, streaming shows in that space, whatever you would think of as like the comedy shows in those spaces, sketch comedy or talk shows and those writers don't even have the normal protections that that the rest of the writers in the guild have or you have um you know uh all, all half of half of our members are making the minimum i mean for me uh i what i what i hope to come out of this is that we've addressed uh and then ai which really is a is a, is a danger uh, I want to come out of this feeling like uh, I understand we're not going to get everything we're asking for, but I want to come out of this so that writers have a sense that there's a future in this business, the future that I had. You brought up Golden Girls. I started on Golden Girls, 1988. I got fired from Golden Girls in 1989. So I, I, it wasn't like I was like a, a straight path to success, but I worked from, you know, forgettable show to forgettable show that were canceled ever after 13 episodes but i worked with some great people i had my own kind of apprenticeship working for these showrunners these different showrunners who they themselves had had their own sort of uh a learning experience working and i got to work in movies and i got to try different things and i was able to you know 35 years i've been doing it and i've been able to raise a family i bought a house all those uh things i feel like is the internet going bad here? Or is it my no, no, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, you know, all those things that, and and I'm only, I think, a well-known writer because Rob Burnett. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's freaking uh, out a little bit, but that's on your oh, end. I can't do oh, it. It'll be fine. People can sit here and see you. Oh, okay. Is it, is it my, uh, uh, let's see. They're trying to silence you, David. I they're, know. They're, they're coming for you. They're coming my, to take you away, ha 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 ho, he he, to the happy I, home. I, maybe, uh, maybe I need to close it. Um, no, it's, uh, but, you're okay. No, right. Okay, I'm good now. All right. Um, but um, you know, I, I was able to have this this career and raise a family and get to do it, and I never created that big show that everybody's heard of, and that you know, I got to be known really almost as a writer because of my involvement in the guild. Like I became famous to other writers. And in the business because of that and uh i i've been associated with some great work i've gotten to do some great work i'm very proud of all the work that i've done but i wouldn't be in any way to say that i'm a uh famous famous writer and yet i've had a career and i've had a career because i've done work that's been valuable to the companies that have hired me and anybody who enters the career should have the same chances that i have well, and, and yes, I mean, that's, we need, that's how you gain institutional knowledge, especially in the entertainment business, because, you know, the thing about writing is it's one thing to write a great story, but it's a whole other issue when you are writing for a certain medium. You have to understand how, uh, how a show works in terms of how it's made, right. um, what is possible when you're writing, how to write, like we said earlier, for a budget, things like that. But I guess, you know, I didn't mean to like put you on the spot asking you, what would you come away with? I think more the idea that writing as a as a profession. I love that you said you know that you could it could be preserved because if you look at all the great writers uh, in the days of yore, they they wrote for decades. 
Right. You know, the, uh, whether it was Rod Serling or whether it was Gene Roddenberry, you know, went from show to right. show, then created a, a show like Star Trek. But if you look at the people like, like Shonda Rhimes or you look at, you know, Taylor Sheridan and, and, and a whole network is being built on the back yeah. of Taylor Sheridan shows. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and, and you can bet your bottom dollar he gets what he wants, you right. know. Right. And, and so, well, it, it, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, I mentioned Ron Moore earlier, but there's another writer who I've gotten to know a little bit during the strike. His name is Dave Weddle. And, uh, Huge fan of his, by the way, Deep Space right. Nine. And, and Dave is a guy who's like also been on a lot of those shows I named that Ron Galactica. Was on. Yeah. And, and, and for all mankind, baby. Boy, do I I'm love a that show. I'm a fan of his work. I've, I've watched his stuff that he wrote with his partner and, and the stuff he does now. And it's like, you know, that guy's had a good long career too like like and you know like and is giving joy to people and and making money for his employer so it's great that that he's been able to stay a writer like it it it, it runs a gamut i think that i think about a writer i'm a huge fan of jane espenson you know jane uh great great writer and and done so many things in her career that it's so interesting and, and always brings her own like take on it and you can sort of hear her voice through the voice of the show that she's writing for or whatever she's working on and there's somebody who like you know has a has a career because there's there the the the, the business allowed her to stay in it at whatever point she need she needed to ride out any highs and lows i mean i i don't know her specific story i met her i've worked with her once and it's great it's a great person too but um uh but so those are like there are all these sort of like variety of careers that happen in the business. Those again, those big names that you mentioned, but also plenty of names that, you know, have their fan base or or, or just have a career because they they bring something to the party. They're they're getting paid for it and they they get to survive as a writer. That that to me is really the the, the thing. Do you see that as being viable? Do you see that future? Where we we can have this kind of these right because I think obviously, I mean, mankind has been telling stories to one another since we came out of the trees and started slopping paint onto cave walls. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing about it is the the you know there's still always a drive for people to tell stories to find that connection through their work, through their writing, through their art, whatever, however you want it, whatever you want to call it, and we can't stop ourselves from doing. It. Um, less people will do it if we don't fix the problem. And we may not get some of those things. We may not get some of those people who who found their way into this business and created really memorable, wonderful stuff. Uh, and that's sort of what this fight is about, is making sure that it stays by This is the, that's, that's, that's a real danger right now uh, with, with the economy, with you know, uh, the corporations, uh, you know, Disney, that like Amazon, all laying off people, not like it, it, the numbers growing as the year goes on. Um, and uh, I mean, the timing of this kind of couldn't have been worse for both sides. It, it, and I say that as just a, again, somebody who's an observer. Uh, and uh, is that like a real worry or um, you probably... It's always a bad time for the companies. Uh, the companies are making billions of dollars in operating profits. Those layoffs that you're seeing, uh, just and this is where it gets a little complicated, but it, you know, if they're paying their CEOs uh, the millions of dollars they're paying them, those companies aren't in trouble. Uh, <laughs> that they're, what they're trying to do is uh, they're trying to please Wall Street. Now there's this thing in Wall Street where uh, a company needs to not just show that they're profitable, but to show that they have profit growth. That is, they had this much profit, they had this much profit last quarter, this quarter we got this much profit, this next quarter we got this much profit. And the way they do that is by laying people off, cutting costs. And so if you look at, let's say, Warner Brothers stock after they did all those layoffs after the merger, Warner Brothers stock was through the roof and was was rated a great scott so so for the workers at those companies 
it's a bad time. They're laying people off. They're laying executives off. But those companies are just fine. They're just fine. They're making, still making billions in operating revenue. They made, they were making twenty, thirty billion dollars a year in operating revenue. Twenty twenty two, they made nine billion, but that had to do with what happened at Warner Brothers Discovery, that merger, and then also the la- the, the the spending they did to launch their streaming service. But we're nine billion dollars in operating profits. Those are not companies in trouble, uh, but they put it on the back. And this is where I start to sound like, you know, a union guy, but they put it on the backs of labor. They fire people, but the companies aren't in trouble. They're not about to go under. They're, they're doing just fine. Well, I, I have a question, too, about, <clears throat> you know, in terms of there's only a finite number of households, say, in the United States. Let's call it, I don't know. 175 million households that are going to subscribe to Netflix. That's all there is. There isn't like, there's no more growth in the marketplace. Like once you've saturated, there's literally a cap in terms of in each country, how many households there are that are going to get any streaming service. If, if, if they got all the numbers in the world, there's only a finite amount of people ultimately. Right. So at the end of the day, I, I don't understand why, like you said, there's this growth because eventually streaming as a medium, you know, they're talking about how much money they've spent. They've spent so much money because they'll spend $200 million on one movie, which seems absurd to me considering right. there's no box office for that film. There's literally no, I, I don't understand that model at all. We've seen some movies, especially this year in the horror market. We saw right. Smile. That was a $17 million spend. It was going to go straight to streaming. They yeah. it tested through the roof. It goes into theaters. It makes two hundred million dollars worldwide. Uh, Evil Dead Rise, same thing. It's made fifty million dollars so far. Um, and and again, because the writing was there, the technique was there, the directing was there. Eventually, they're going to try and get AI to do everything. Right. You know, you'll put in all of David Fincher's movies, and it'll even know what lenses, what what lens size right. you used, well, and yeah, no, and the, it'll all be it'll all be analyzed, and they'll be able to recreate a david fincher film give me a david fincher romantic comedy with his style i mean we're not that far away from 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 that place and it's going to get even more even more terrifying and i i think the question too here is i think part of the fight that you have that most people aren't even thinking about is what is the future of of us of of people of humanity in the wake of of what are we going to do if, if people aren't even, if writers aren't going to be used to, to make these things anymore, then what is it we're going to get a great big feedback loop? There's going to be no innovation. There's going to be no generational stories anymore because they're just going to be scraped from the internet. And what's, what is that going to say about us as a people? As a, how, how, well, why I would life? To, yeah, I don't want to live in that future, Rob. Uh, I don't either. And I think, like you said, the the preservation of look. I understand if somebody can make not spend money, they're not going to spend money. Right. But there is also, uh, I think, there is also something to be said. The human element is is what I mean. Storytelling itself is based on sharing human truths. Like, hey, this is what happened to me today. Oh, that happened to me yesterday. I I totally understand what you're saying. And if we no longer have that as the basis of our of our the stories that we tell one another, and it's just regurgitated nonsense from a machine that's never lived where does that leave us and that's what worries that's what worries me i mean look at the great writers we're getting some of the best <clears throat> television i mean there's always been great television writing and not so great television writing but but in terms of the things that we've been getting depending on what you want to what genre you want to see there's some amazing tv being written now um i mean look at succession is a story of people that basically takes place in rooms just people talking to one another right. and and it's astonishing you know it's what is it is it just jesse alexander is he the showrunner of that show yeah, great, great show but also that the, the it's expensive rooms I, that that the budget well, that is not, is not <clears> well that's because they're in new york and shooting outside and but Euro- and europe and uh, you know yeah but but i mean still isn't yeah, right. that what but isn't that what we want and isn't that what the ultimately the studios are selling that product I mean, they, they act like their product somehow at its core can be artificially manufactured. 
but they've they've showed they've always sold us artificiality that's been created by people but if artificiality isn't being created by people then the artificiality isn't real well, i remember uh i remember uh reading in a book about saturday night live uh, it was a, it was an old i, I might it might have been that oral history or there was that other book i don't know if you remember that, that came out in the 80s about snl anyway <coughs> lauren michael was talking about the fact that he was talking about the fact that after the after the first five seasons when he left he was certain either they were going to not let him leave or they were just going to stop making the show and that when he because he was leaving and he leaves and they keep making the show and he knew he was integral to it and, and it's, he's proven to be um uh but he remembers having this realization oh they don't care if it's good uh the execs just they had snl it was this big thing and they were just going to keep making it and then you had a couple of really terrible ba bad seasons of snl before it sort of found its way back to what it what it what it, uh, it continues to be i think um but uh that that's the unfortunate nature of of the hollywood business i think and that goes back to the beginning like there were always some people in in the business who cared about making important work or made about cared about making quality work, even if it was for the masses, it didn't have to be overly intellectual, but they, they put, and then there were a lot of people, especially in some of the executive suites who didn't care if it was good, did it make money or did it, did, did we, did we, you know, did we observe the bottom line? And I think part of the problem with some of, some of the streaming model is that there are, you know, that, you know, that term, churn you know just like we're just going to keep keep putting stuff out there and um that to me uh, that that's the death of of great of great uh art uh you know we 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 love uh, uh again that thing you were talking about that connection to the to the art that the that artist creates by writing something that's meaningful to us what wherever it's set what however it takes place and if it's only about putting product out, um, you know that that will that will have less and less of that good stuff. Well, that, that's that problem's already started. Like that's that's really I mean that's the the, the streamers' approach, and it, and it almost you read a great article, Robert, uh, on your live stream a couple of days ago about the whole venture capitalist uh, venture uh, approach, the IP, the big you tech like approach. What, yeah, what David was saying, absolutely. Yeah, and, and it and it's, and it's I, I think that article it, like most of it was right. I think it's missing another big thing. But uh, I think like when they're really talking about the corporations and just you know uh, being risk averse and being safe, uh, you know, hey, it gives writers work, but it also doesn't give them a chance, and it's also you know not making use of the good writers enough, in my opinion. And they 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 keep as David just said they keep churning out stuff, and on this unrealistic time scale, uh, you know we, we could even go back to like the Star Wars movie the, the Disney Star Wars movies. You know George used to make them three years apart. They made them two years apart. There's a reason George made them three years apart because he needed to make them three years apart. That that's that's how they were better, uh, in my opinion, not David's opinion, my opinion. But um uh, and and. I, you know, a lot of this, uh, you know, can we talk about uh, real quick? Cause I know it's been, uh, I've saw, I've seen George R. R. Martin bring it up. I saw uh, Neil Gaiman bring it up. The mini room. Is that something yes. you can uh, talk about? Uh, sure. I'm sorry. I, I just realized what the time was. Um, yeah. We'll let you go, man. No, no, no. It's all right. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, yeah, well, the mini room is the is thing that I was talking about where writers are, hired for a very short length of time, a group of writers, it could be a small group, and their job in that mini room is to uh, break a whole season of a show. That is break it, meaning coming up with all the stories and all the episodes, and then, so you're, you're coming up with a whole season of a show, and then at the end of that 10 weeks where you've been hired to do that work, which is not a lot of time to figure all that out, everybody else goes off and everybody in the room goes off writes a script and then they may get fired and they're not part of uh the uh the production of that show 
and one writer or two writers have to do all the work to get those scripts into shape and then shootable shape. And as Rob pointed out, using their experience about like what is shootable and what isn't, and then make that show on their own. And so that ends up being two sides of the same thing, which is those writers in that room, you know, that they didn't get the experience of being involved in the production of the show. And one, one or two writers have to produce the whole thing. And that's too much for that number of people. And so those are that, that you know, um, what a great thrill of, uh, actually of, of, of getting to be the lead, in the leadership of the guild is I, I got to talk to George last week on this topic and uh, what it, you know, a huge fan and get to talk to these, these writers, but he, he really got out there and was talking about his own experience and how he became a writer and uh, in television and, and that if he wouldn't have been as good if he didn't get that, that uh, experience. Well, and people forget George R. R. Martin goes all the way back to Beauty and the Beast. I mean, he he the, yeah. that show back in the eighties. You know, Linda Hamilton and Ron Ron Perlman. And and his first job was on uh, one of the newer versions of the Twilight Zone. Yeah, Twilight. the eighties, the the Phil DeGare produced Twilight Zone, which was yeah. by the way incredible. Yeah. Uh, we have a pretty good, an interesting question. B. K. Dan asks, Mister Goodman, do you believe or feel that the W. J. Strike will cause? not only more reality shows like in 2008, but also calls cause streamers to look overseas for writers. Interesting question. And we've and I've heard that. Um, well, what's interesting about uh, your comment about what, what was the person's name? Uh, uh, BK Dan. BK Dan. So BK Dan, what's interesting about that reality show after the last strike is it's actually not true. Uh, there were plenty of reality shows before the strike. It's just the, the studios, uh, relied on them for a few minutes uh, while we were on strike, but at, soon after everything sort of went back to normal. It wasn't. It didn't. I mean, the only, you know, I mean, there wasn't. I, I guess it gave us the Apprentice, but otherwise, <laughs> the uh, 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 otherwise, it actually didn't really change the TV landscape that much. It did for a short moment in time, for that for like even less than a year, where. The studios, because they didn't have product ready for the fall season, uh, maybe put a few more reality shows on. But eventually, uh, uh, they they really got back to normal pretty quickly. Um, and then, what was the second question, Rob? Uh, about oh, tra- right. looking foreign. Well, I mean, you know, what's interesting about that, too, is, and this is what I say all the time, is that um, the companies are what are, what are called signatories to the NBA. That is, the companies that we work for sign on to our contract. And as a result, when we're on strike, they can't hire uh, writers to do work wherever they are. They can't hire them in other countries. On the other, uh, on top of that, there are other Writers Guild unions around the world, all of whom uh, stand in solidarity with us and, and wouldn't allow that either. So this idea that there would be this sort of influx of foreign work or foreign foreign workers taking our job is just a you know, it's a straw man. It's not actually anything that would or could happen. Um, we have two hundred watch studio says when everything is resolved, please bring back the Orville for seasons four through seven. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, I would never count Seth MacFarlane out. I've known him twenty something years and. Uh, I remember telling him, oh, they'll never bring Family Guy back. And I was completely wrong about that. And Orville, so he's, I think, trying to get more episodes. And uh, if somebody can, if one person can get it done, it, it, it's Seth. So. Uh, Brent sends in a tip, and this is interesting. He said, AI is more than just writing. There's a very good thread on why this strike is so pivotal. Please take a second to read. This was something Justine Bateman I won't yeah. read it all because it's a Twitter no, I, thread. I, I, right. In, yeah, that was a great thread. I, I was right. funny coming from Justine Bateman. It's like good She's for member you. Of the guild, member of the guild. She stood up at a meeting and I wanted to. I met. I wanted to tell her I, I, the script I broke into on Golden Girls was a family ties spec with my partner at the time. So. Wow. So <laughs> just, go Justine. Well, you know, David. I mean, you've been with us for an hour, and I very much appreciate your time. Yeah. I mean, what can you say? to both uh the studios and your fellow writers obviously you've been out on the strike lines every day uh people have i've heard just from people 
how how they've run into you, you know, and you're you're, you're rallying the troops. Right. Um, uh, what can you say to the writers out there, and what can you say to to maybe the studios and as sort of a what do you say to the writers on the strike line? You know, what how do you rally well, when them? When I see them, I mean, to me, I, I'm a it's it's one of the one of I'm sort of talking about it earlier. I love talking to writers. I mean, I. I, it's the it's the greatest gift of being involved in this union is that I go out on the strike line and and I meet writers and I get and I watch a lot of television movies and I get to talk to these writers who who have created this work that I love. I mean, I know you you share that, Rob. I mean, you love talking to writers. I do. I do. We share that. We share that uh, that thing. It's like you love hearing. How did you do this? Or what were you thinking? Or you know or asking specific questions I've got, you know, uh, I always, I, I love that. And so that's one of the reasons I, I go and talk to the writers, but also because I'm a leader in the union now, I, I want to make sure that everybody's feeling, still feeling strong and they are, it's clear that, that the issues we raise with the company speak directly to our members. We, we listened to our members and the struggles they were having, and that's how we crafted our proposals. And, so that's mostly w why I do it, and that's what and the writers know, you know, that this leadership, not just me, but the elected leadership of the guild and Chris Kaiser, who's my partner, is the co-chair of the negotiating committee. It's like all we care about is, you know, how are the writers feeling? What, what, how do you feel about what we're doing? How do you feel about uh, your career and 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 your future? And that and that's what we're here for is to make. To make sure that we we have that future and that's what this fight is about and and i have a lot of friends at the studios or maybe less now than i used to but uh <laughs> but a lot of friends i was doing a show in atlanta called hysteria which was about the uh, satanic panic in the 80s uh and i had to walk off i had to walk off the show and i was having a really great time not just working with uh, the writer matthew scott kane who created it but also the the executives uh, who were working on the show were so supportive, really wanted to make a great show. And I, I've worked with a lot of executives like that. There are still plenty of, plenty of people on that side of the table who want to make good stuff. And uh, that's all we're doing. That's all we're trying to do is make sure that, that writers can stay writers so that we can make good, profitable stuff. Gary, do you have any f final uh, questions for David? Uh, I'll make it super quick. No, no. Uh, are are you negotiating now, or is it, is there any time you're going back to the table to have a serious negotiation? A strike is is negotiating. Yeah, being yeah. out on the picket line is is a is a. It's, and I'm not just speaking in hyperbole. It is like, okay, you don't want to talk to us about these things we've raised. Guess what? And we're going to show you how serious we are about it. And we're going to stand in the hot sun with a picket sign and walk in a circle. And we're gonna have a good time doing it. Uh, that's the thing is that writers get together, and as hard as this is, they they share stories and it buoys their spirits, and it's kind of a great thing to see. Um, we will absolutely, at some point, get back in the room with the companies and try to, you know, and and I and I know that the strike is it matters to them. They they we're shutting down television shows and movies and. And this is the only thing some of these companies make. And uh, that's going to matter to them. So, you know, we're serious and we know they're serious and we'll get back to it at, at some point. David, how can people, just the, the lay person, how can uh, they find out more information about the strike? How sure. can they, uh, what can they do to support writers? What are some of the things that, that uh, people that aren't necessarily connected to L.A. or aren't on the strike lines can do for you guys? Well, I mean, you know, LA and New York, I mean, you can always come join a picket line. Happy to have you. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, you know, there's, if, if you have any, any money, there's the entertainment community fund, which is not as a, is a fund that's established to help people in the business who are having difficulties. So not even just writers, but uh, crew people, uh, actors who, are on are having a tough time and may may be facing financial hardship because of the strike. Uh, so if you wanted to make a donation to that, it's always welcome. There's information about the WGA in 
on our on the website wj.org a lot of writers on twitter as you know uh there's a lot of a lot of talk about the strike and then also there's uh fans i, I think fans of 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 your favorite show whatever it is uh, organizing in support of the writers that's always something that's welcome uh because i think fans like the fans of your show uh understand that it's like the the stuff they're watching uh is is starts with a writer and a blank page well listen david i want to tell everybody out there uh you do have a movie that you recently wrote that was critically acclaimed and is on paramount plus called honor society Thank you. i watched it I, I quite enjoyed it and you won you even won an award for it i did um and uh, also you know you wrote the autobiography of captain james t kirk <laughs> and uh i that that, that, that by the way career, right there yeah. that's <laughs> just that's not me bullshitting you actually wrote a star trek novel the autobiography of james c kirk which i i have to i gotta throw it in you know people and no i to. love that it's one of my favorite pieces of writing I, I, I oh it's fantastic yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh so so there you go i want to thank you for being on the show uh gary i'd love to keep you for a little while if i could yeah. oh, and yeah. um so oh, always, always great to see you robin great to meet you gary and, nice to meet uh, you too thanks for talking to us uh, my pleasure and uh see you soon all right. Well, David, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Gary, I want to thank you for coming on. And I want to thank uh, David Goodman for being here as well. Um, now, what do you think? I mean, after talking to, I know you you, you had asked and, and um, did you learn I anything? I yeah, I did. I did. I mean, like, there's a lot of questions he just couldn't have answered because right. he represents the union. So I, I get that aspect of it. And he's in negotiations. And he's currently in negotiations. So, and I, you know, believe it or not, I don't want to be a dick, but um, at least not until I'm on my channel. Anyway. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I really look, I, I look, as I said, I mean, people have always said to me, why do I talk to people I talk to? And as I said at the top of the hour, I've really enjoyed, I mean, I've always watched you. I've known about you, known you for a long time, but I've really appreciated, I think that you've, you've done these, a pivot on your channel and you've been creating this really interesting produced content that you were using Perry. And I always forget the name of your other editor, the second editor you use. Order Black Garrett. Uh, and you've been doing some really great work and I would encourage everybody to look into those videos and, um, you know, I, I think what's really important is we can have conversations with people, learn from them, and then go make our own content and say whatever we want. But the important yep. thing is to have the conversations yep. and and um, and to be able to talk to one another. <laughs> so, and when you like had we to. like we used to, and like when you we. when you asked me about the WGA, the Writers Guild, because you were going to do a piece on it, I figured, well, why not go to the go to the source. You know, yeah. Believe it or not, when I when I take this video has become kind of a monster, but um, I uh, I've pieced together some articles, but it just it, we're generally getting one side. Most of the media is is going to be on the writer's side, and I'm not on anybody's side, by the way. I, I'm just a customer, so I'm observing all this. I am no fan of the corporations and how they operate, and I think they are uh, mostly to blame for what has gone on with our favorite entertainment right now with the criticisms I have of it, but I think it's also a team effort. I think sure. it's a team effort there that's gone on, but I, you know, I also don't want to like, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to get my facts wrong. Uh, I'm not that I'm perfect or anything, but I want to be well informed and there's certainly writers that I love and I hope they make all the money possible. I, I that's all I want. You know, if you're a good writer, I, I make a pool, fill it full of money and swim in it every day that's uh, go for it I'm, I'm not against making money uh but what the realities of it and like i don't like these companies are making lots of money uh, that's from uh, because most of them deal in other things right but are they making money on entertainment that's i guess that's a question i probably should have asked like amazon doesn't need to make entertainment no this amazon a, and apple don't at all i mean apple yeah, Amazon, the reason you get Prime is for shipping. They want you to keep paying for shipping, so you buy their products. They're, the TV shows they're making are an afterthought. And as we've seen, I mean, no company is, has – there's more there's more profligate spending on between two shows, 
uh, Rings of Power and Citadel, you're you're talking about a billion dollars mm-hmm. uh, for for literally fourteen episodes of TV. Fourteen episodes. And, and Citadel. Has anybody heard of Citadel? I, like, I saw I'm, a trailer for it, and I know it from reading an article. But prior to that, I'm like, I knew there was a Russo Brothers thing happening. But like Citadel's not like a great title. It's very average. Uh, it's got a, you know a couple of decent stars in it, but like three hundred million dollars. They fired a showrunner and reshot the whole damn thing. Yeah, and, I mean th- uh, this is what I and this is again I think the loss of the institutional knowledge in yeah. the business is is detrimental. There are people that don't, first of all people have made successful uh, Rick Berman. As an example, the producer of Star Trek, he produced 25 seasons of Star Trek over 18 years, TNG to the end of Enterprise. He never went over budget. And they were making shows for, for a, million, a couple of million bucks back, you know, starting in 87 because he knew how to produce a TV show. You know, it's not rocket science and there shouldn't be overspending on a TV show. Well-run productions, and I've worked on a number, I've, I've I've worked on productions where I'm running around with a video camera where I can film anything I want, which could be very damaging in the long run. And when I think about the movies that I worked on, $200 million movies like Chronicles of Narnia and Superman Returns and things like that, Superman Returns was an incredibly well-run set. You know, everybody, Gil Adler, the producer, really knew what he was doing. And even though it had a big budget, there people weren't we weren't going over you know it it stuck to its schedule and tv should be that way as well i mean there's no reason why how can you shoot a whole show and then have to shoot it again now i mean i think it's i mean there's so many factors in it but what comes you know i talked to chris today chris gore and i talk about this to him every because he's such an indie film fan i am too i'm an indie fan and it's the loss of that indie market and film and and streaming has just flooded uh you know television with uh bodies they basically just threw in bodies without uh proper training you know i did a video um about the oscar rules which i think are insane absolutely insane but there's one thing in there they talked about that i liked if they would approach it correctly but they're not which is mentorships which is the companies pooling their money organizations pooling their money to bring in people and to train to train yeah, like that, I, that makes sense absolutely for it a thousand percent that's a good idea uh, well cultivate your talent the ultimately too <clears throat> you know the the thing that i think that is not understood is no one is preventing anybody from making movies mm-hmm. you know when spike lee made she's gotta have it mid 80s he basically financed it himself through his job you know, he makes a movie about a, a black woman living in Brooklyn who had multiple boyfriends. I saw this. I'm living in Seattle. I see this at a film festival for the first time. It was apparent to me that here was a new filmmaking voice. Two films later, he made School Days. Then he made Do the Right Thing, which is an incredible American film. It's 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 a, a new voice. No one gave Spike Lee an opportunity. He was not a product of, of some quota or some... He picked up... He, he wanted to make a movie and went out and made a movie. And no one told him he could or couldn't. He just did it. And all the great independent filmmakers, especially we saw that in the late 80s, early 90s, whether it was Steven Soderbergh, whether it was Kevin Smith, the reason you don't have as many female filmmakers is because they're not insane like men are. You know, <laughs> women are inherently pragmatic. <laughs> and they're like, wait a minute. Okay, you're going to go make a movie how are you going to do that? That's why female producers are great producers because they're the ones that have to manage us crazy uh, efforts when we go out and do something. Women are like, that's great, but let me help you do this because I don't think you're thinking about the fact that catering costs money. <laughs> you know, you know we, and, and so you see some of the great producers in Hollywood like Gail Ann Hurd who managed James Cameron for a while when they were married. She was the woman that said to James Cameron, uh, at the beginning of Aliens, we're not budgeted for that blue laser. You want to scan the inside of the Narcissus. We're not. You can't have that. You're gonna have to pay for that yourself. And James Cameron did. <laughs> you know, and and that's the thing that bothers me about these rules is demographically, who there's not a lot of people that want to go into the arts in the first place. So when you start saying that 50 percent of the people that you have to hire, you're talking about smaller demographics of people. And of those demographics, how many of them want to go into the arts? 
And of those, the people that really want to go into the arts, how committed are they? And so I think what we should be doing is not making quotas about who can be in an Oscar movie, but we should encourage people of all shapes, sizes, colors, and creeds to go make movies themselves. Yep. And and learn, look, learn on the job. I would encourage, in fact, I think everybody should try and make a movie because they realize how fucking hard it is to do, much less how hard it is to finish. And the reason why there aren't a bunch of filmmakers running around now is because it's really hard and you don't see a lot of great up and coming young maverick filmmakers like we saw. Where's the Kevin Smith of today? Where's mm-hmm. the female Kevin Smith? I mean, you look at how much clerks cost not a lot of money. Where 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 are all the the, the all the different kinds of people that should be making movies for thirty thousand dollars? Where are those movies? Where are those people making those movies? Because according to certain people in Hollywood, it's just a big gate that's keeping all of these people out. And I would say, look at how many film festivals there are. Look at how many outlets there are. Where's all the filmmakers? And a TikTok video is not a film. No, and it's and you're right. It's cheaper now than ever to produce this stuff. I mean, editing software. 4K cameras. You carry them in your pocket. Yep. Uh, uh, You know, I remember when Final Cut Pro you know, came around and, and made everything a lot cheaper because before, you know, it, it was a lot to get editing software. And then uh, it, it now it's easier than ever. Uh, it's easier than ever to make your own comic book. It's easier than ever to make your own novel and publish your own novel. You don't need these gatekeepers. And that's going to be the interesting thing the WGA has to uh, deal with. Both the producers and the WGA have the same problem right now. And it's YouTube. And it's social media mm. because there's free entertainment out there right now so you're asking people to take on more and more streaming services which you know we all everybody said this at the beginning of whatever these streaming wars are is eventually it's going to be four or five big big ones that are going to end up licensing that's that's how it's just going to end that's just going to end up being like the networks but uh they have to be up against something like youtube which is too dumb to even know like what kind of power they have because they want to be something else and they just put up with us content creators right now. But during a strike, people are going to still want entertainment, and it's free. They can just go to YouTube and watch whatever the hell they want. And that's my preference now. I would. I don't watch a late night anymore. I haven't watched late night in years. I watch Rob. I, I watch. <laughs> I watch my friend Col- Culture Casino. I watch Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers. I watch my friends. I, I watch. Uh, you know, a, a channel and like the size of the channel doesn't matter. I subscribe to over three hundred channels. I watch. All of them at some point, mm. all of them I spend a ton of time on YouTube and I'll be in a chat with three people being totally entertained. No, I talking about a movie. Or I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I start my day now um, watching whatever came up on on YouTube overnight, usually yep. uh, obviously new trailers. But but there's a lot of people and I subscribe to a lot of different kinds of channels of all kinds of a lot of different political shows on both sides of the aisle. You know, um, uh, because why not? You know, I don't understand why we become so tribal. And I, you know, if, if somebody is a good thinker and can actually give give me their ideas clearly, even if I disagree with them, I learn. Because when you hear somebody you disagree with, you're you're judging them based on what you believe. And if your if your beliefs are strong, they're not going to be harmed by somebody who has an alternative viewpoint. In fact, you'll either appreciate what you believe more or you'll have a greater understanding of what you believe. So talking to people or listening to people that are diametrically opposed from you is only a healthy, uh, enriching experience, I think. And and so there's a lot of people that I disagree with, but I respect. You know, and, yeah. and and I think that's the great thing about YouTube is there's so many different. I mean, I watch channels about uh, auto YouTube. I don't know shit about cars. You know, I use cars as a utilitarian device, but I like watching people. Like, there's this guy Manny Koshpin who's got millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of supercars that I will never own, but I like seeing what he buys. You know, what do you buy next? Yeah, no, it's, it's entertaining. It's like you know, like why people watch Top Gear. Not everybody's gearhead, but they'll watch. You know, the old Top Gear, not the new one. But you're right. You know, YouTube allows uh, the future, as you say, uh, the currency of the future is authenticity. It is. And what YouTube allows you to do is mess up, is not be perfect, not be in the studio, get facts wrong and go, oh, whoops, got that run wrong. Sorry. And people automatically are, are 
that that's endearing. That's really endearing. And to, like, just to give my perspective, like, if you want to know where I'm coming from, you can find out on any live stream. I'll, I'll give you an anecdotal story. I'll tell you why I'm a hardcore individualist. And it has everything to do with my upbringing and my experience in life, having um, any safety nets ripped out from under me from uh, a very young age, uh, being basically on my own. <laughs> you know, I wasn't even raised by wolves. I was self-raised uh, <laughs> and I was able to be successful. I got through a very hard time and I found success through determination, through working hard. And there aren't many countries that I can count maybe on one hand would that would have given me the opportunity uh, after my fifth or sixth mistake to succeed and, and to now, you know, be a law abiding citizen, uh, have a family, own a home, pay my mortgage. These are things that were alien to me, like just absolutely. So that's where my perspective is politically. I'm an independent. And I am a hardcore individualist and I don't believe in uh, collectivism. That's, that's just my, that's, it my doesn't, it doesn't view. work. It's anti-human yeah. because eventually yeah. it, it, the, the human spirit to innovate, to go find you, to, to follow your bliss is not supported by collectivism. Um, I, but like you, I've always believed in this, the, the, the greatness of the sovereign individual, yep. you know, and, and that's one of the things that the West uh, created really with our legal the legal system and it allowed for individualism to flourish and that was something we didn't really have before and now you know as we see the the basic tenets of western civilization being undercut for a number of reasons from a number of different areas the idea of the individual is sort of being undermined as well and it's it's too bad and we should fight against it every step of the way because it's individuals that make history absolutely and it, it's such a it's just like there's a difference between like I, it, it enrages me when I hear that that people are being called marginalized. All right. Now, life isn't fair. There are no. unfair things about society, about life that are effed up that we need to work on. I don't have the answers for it. But you as a person uh, are not marginalized. You're just not like I marginalized myself. I was, I marginalized myself when I got myself out of it and it wasn't privilege and it wasn't money and I didn't get any freaking chances from anybody. Um, and I know it's a different experience for other people, but uh, that's, that's the thing that gets me pissed off is like, you're, you're not marginalized as a person. You, you know, deck stacked against you. Sure. Like it's been stacked against me too. And, and it's going to be, uh, could be a lot worse but it doesn't mean you can't get out from under it. And and I really hate that that's a message that's coming from so many corporations. Funny oh, enough. it's it, it, look, anyone who lives in the West, anywhere where you can shoplift fresh produce, that's a luxury we have in this country that a lot of people don't have around the world. Fresh right. produce is something, I mean, if you really think about it, and I'm not, I'm not saying shoplift. The point is, is that there's fresh produce you can shoplift. There's a lot of places on this planet where that is an unheard of luxury. And, and that, is a, that is a privilege of being in the West. We, we were born privileged living in the United States, no matter who you are, because you can shoplift free produce. And, and people forget all about that. They make it sound like this is a terrible place to be. And the thing about this country is you can do anything you want. And and this weird message that suddenly everyone is oppressed, everyone's a victim, is is I don't understand. And oh, I only can say that because I'm I'm privileged. I'm like, no, I I've known people that have made something of themselves. They they conjured stuff out of thin air. People of all shapes, sizes, colors, and creeds, and sexualities and religious beliefs. They've got they've made shit up. They went out and did it and conjured it out of thin air through hard work, perseverance, and some talent, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's, I think that's what's so great is no one is stopping you, the individual, from doing anything. Now, you can't say, well, I want to go out and make the next Oscar-winning film. You also have to temper what it is you want. Look, I'd like to live in a, I'd live in a castle in the sky. I would love to live in a castle in the sky. That is not going to happen. That is not something... Having an understanding what an attainable goal is 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 uh, is also a uh, something we need to know. I think. Right. I mean, I hate to fly in planes, but I would love to fly. That would be awesome. Right. Yeah. That would be and, freaking dope. 
and, and you might you might soon you, you could in the next ten years you'll have a flying car that you look you don't want to fly but you can keep it thirty feet above the ground and it'll That'd have a cool. stable gyroscope and you can. Well, listen. Um, uh, there's just a few more things. Uh, Alex Ockler says, "Hey, love everything you do, Rob." Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Brandon Anderson sends in a super chat and says, "I appreciate David coming on to explain this to us that mm-hmm. aren't in showbiz." His side of the story. Most know very little about the business, and we only have our outside conception of it. So thank you, David. You know, this is an important example of what I always say on the show, that every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And I really believe that. I think that more than ever, not just people being authentic, but in our AI world where, I mean, if you read about how many bots are in, are on the web commenting Things there's whole you can now goose corporations can goose whatever they want with their army of bots. You want to do something, mm-hmm. so real authenticity is is something that's going to be in short supply. And so you know when you have someone like David Goodman to come on here, and obviously he can only say with what he could say within reason. But I know David, and he's a stand up guy, and he's a talented guy, and the fact that he gave us his time is a great privilege. So I thank him and I appreciate the hearing that you appreciated that, um, Brandon, is very, that's that means a lot to me. Uh, this is directed to you, Gary. Bert says, I just started reading The Invisibles by Grant Morrison, my first read of theirs. What are your spoiler-free opinions, especially Gary, you as a former comic book store owner, how did it do in the trade paperback format? Uh, It sold extremely well, and I think it is some of uh, Mr. Morrison's best work. I was going to say I have the giant hardcover just off screen here. Um, It's it's one of the great comics, maybe of all time, certainly one of the best Vertigo comics. Absolutely. Uh, Again, like couldn't keep it on the shelf. Yeah. It sold through. It cycled through almost weekly. So that's freaking good. And all the volumes. Um. Six Scale Mafia says, I grew up very similar. I got where I am because I work for it. I never had a helping hand and had to learn mostly on my own at a very young age, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. No. I wouldn't trade any of my experiences for anything. All the horrible ones, all the good ones, it led me to uh, to hear. Talking to Rob. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Kel Razor yeah. says, as Hawkeye said on MASH, I may not agree with what you had to say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. I think someone said that before Hawkeye. Mm-hmm. Call me crazy, but it's still a it's still a great uh, great sentiment. Um, Ash loves Ash. Uh, it's so good. Uh, Six Scale Mafia also said, "Rob, my friend Berman was great. Produced, in my opinion, the best era of Star Trek. Honestly, aside from TOS, without Berman, I probably wouldn't have a job. Nice to see Gary here too. I've been watching Gary for years. Cheers. Thank you." And I, I publicly apologized to, to Berman, who I didn't... Well, he never heard my complaints about him when Star Trek was getting stale towards the end. There was well, no internet, but uh, it was a couple of years ago I did a whole stream where I apologized to Rick Berman. He was right. He was a legend. I was wrong. Well, listen, Gary, uh, thank you for coming on the show. This was terrific, and I wouldn't have done this if it wasn't your... If you didn't inspire me to do it, so I'm glad you were able to come on. Uh, what do you have, I mean, aside from all the stuff you have coming up, let me ask you this. This Writers Guild video that you're doing, are we going to see it this coming weekend, or is it going to take too long? Yeah, it's going to be about a week. About I would a week. say at least a week. Uh, it's going to be handed to Perry on the weekend. I'm going to be doing one before that. On now let me ask you, just from a matter of process, um, do you write script for these before you shoot them? No. No, I, uh, uh, I'll show you. It's gonna it, it's gonna be embarrassing. This is my video. So I got comic book backing boards that I recycle from my bag and board show, and I bullet point and chicken scratch. And then when I hit my bullet point, I uh, I put a highlight line through it. That is my writing process. <laughs> but no, but you're still writing, so that's you're not just winging it. You've got an outline. Because I've re- each line basically. Sure, but I, I've really enjoyed the videos, and as I said, your 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 editorial staff is killing it. So. You, I, I've, I'm blessed with like two really great people. But it, they have to have your your interesting insight to start with. So that's I that's I'm always curious about how people do YouTube videos because I'm starting to write some scripted videos that I'm going to do for my channel. These things uh, that are called ten and twenties, and they're going to be ten things 
that I'll like. I'm going to start with Star Trek. Ten episodes of each season of Star Trek. Not the most definitive list, but a sort of a primer for those people who've never watched Star Trek. That's You'll, a great idea. Yeah. So they're going to be RMBs ten and twenty, and I'm going to start doing Star Trek. So, but what do you have coming up on your channel? Uh, I have a Marvel video coming out concerning Echo and um, the investors lawsuit, <laughs> which I thought was pretty interesting. Wow. Oh, wow. Some scheming and scamming there. Uh, and then on Friday Night Tights is our variety show that gets pretty salty. It's our 250th episode. We have Chuck Dixon joining us. The Ooh. Goat, the legend comic book writer uh, who has just launched a book, Joe Frankenstein, with Graham Nolan, the great yep. comic book artist. Uh, and so we're going to have Chuck on on Friday. I'm very Did excited. Did Chuck Dixon kill Robin? Did he Chuck do death? Did, did he do death in the family? Yeah, he did. He did death in the family. He did. So he killed Robin. Yeah, yeah, he did. I voted to kill Robin too. Me too. I'm like, kill that little uh, green pants wearing. No, I, I regretted it later. But um, I did. I actually regretted it later. But uh, Chuck Dixon is a legend. He has written uh, uh, great uh, Nightwing runs. Uh, yep. He, te- you know, he invented the Birds of Prey. Uh, he co-created Bane with Graham Nolan. Like they've they've just done so much great stuff. So he is a wealth of knowledge, and he does not tow company lines either. He is a very very independent thinker, and that's why I love him so much. Yeah, that's great. And those both of those guys are incredibly talented. Yeah, they are. So it's it's very cool. Well, listen, I will I will let you go. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, say hi to your your lovely better half for me because she's absolutely delightful, and um, you throw a great party, sir. Oh, thanks for coming, and uh, yeah, I'm glad you got you and my wife got to nerd out about music. I think that was rad. So. Yeah, we we did, and she knows her stuff too. Yeah, she does. Yeah, we uh, she really knows her stuff, so she's great. Well, Gary, I will let you go. Thank you for being thanks, here, and uh, check out Nerdrotic on uh, YouTube, and they can you can follow Gary at Nerdrotics on Twitter. Take care my brother. All right, Bye. I will see you later. See ya. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, uh you know what? This is the kind of YouTube content I'm going to be doing more of going forward. Um I want to have more industry professionals. I know I know there's there's two things that happen on YouTube. People like hanging out. I'm not going to stop hanging out. I like hanging out, doing my own observations, but I would like to also do uh, more collaborations with other people. I want to bring on more people uh, from from various aspects of the entertainment industry. I'm still doing, of course, Designing Hollywood. Um, a new episode's going to be up tomorrow on John Campia's channel, so check that out. Um, and there's just going to be more. Architects of the Imagination, a video game developer podcast, still has episodes to go up. Uh, there wasn't one this past week because people were out of town. But there is another one going up on Saturday. Uh, Lana, Lana Ewan reviews and her husband. Uh, well, Lana Ewan is a person and her husband, Alan. Uh, their next review, they did uh, Stuart Gordon's From Beyond. Their next review is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, I, for one, cannot wait. When when Alan sent me a picture of himself, I guess at, I don't know, Home Depot or whatever, and he was actually buying a chainsaw i'm like oh i hope you don't go too far you crazy kids but i'm really i'm really proud of that so if you haven't seen lana you and reviews check that out um she's going to be doing a lot of psychotronic cinema that i know you'll want to see so i think i've caught up on super chats and all of that and i'm going to end this stream tomorrow by the way uh at 10 a.m bringing back fully articulated with as uh there hasn't been one of those in a while people keep asking about fully articulated it's coming back tomorrow 10 a.m pacific time my man as and i are going to be geeking out over toys so hope to see you there and uh check out the critics court we did today on film threat channel uh that's uh, i put a tie on i mean why would i do that but on that note I want to thank you all for being here. Once again, I want to thank David Goodman. I want to thank all the writers who are on those picket lines uh, fighting the good fight so we can still 
have writers that give us our favorite TV shows and movies. So stay strong, WGA strong. And on that note, remember, I really mean it when I say that every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And I want to thank John Campia for sponsoring this episode of Observations. Find the John Campia Show or the John Campia Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks very much, and as always, have a better night.